So welcome everyone to, I think this is like the 11th or 12th episode of the Torch of Progress. Um, our normal host, Jason Crawford, is out. Um, he is the author of The Roots of Progress and he collaborates with myself and others at Higher Ground Education on this course, um, Progress Studies for Young Scholars, that this is a speaker series for. Um, and that course is a survey of the history of technology, industry, economics, um, especially as it relates to the idea of material progress, the kind of creation of the modern world and all of its aspects, material science, um, economic structures, incentive structures, advances in technology, medicine, textiles, um, safety. Um, there, were, there was an awesome unit at the end of the course on um, the adv advancements in safety measures. Um, and um, we are, um, it, it ran as a summer course, but we are excited to be offering it as a course this fall to high school students um, as an elective course that you can take online. Um, you can visit progressstudies.school to find out more about that. And we are also offering in, I mean, since we started the course, one of the most common requests we've had is, I'm a 35 year old professional and I wanna learn this stuff too. Um, I'm not a high school student. And so we are offering an adult version of the course um progress studies for old scholars um it's not what it's called i think it's i think it's the study group for progress um and it's it's a modified version of the course so it will run um, once a week um for um 10 or 15 weeks and there each week will feature a guest lecturer a guest speaker um, who will come and discuss their work with you these are people who um, some of whom have been on the um, on this podcast um, um discussing their work in the history of progress so really really excited about that as well um, today, I am excited, very excited to be here with Dr. Laura Mazur, um, who is joining us from Michigan. Laura is, what are you? You're, you're a professor of medicine at the University of Michigan in Arbor, is that right? Uh, I am an assistant professor of surgery. Assistant professor of surgery. Cool. Um, welcome, Laura. Thank you. Um, so, um, Laura, um, I've known her for years, and she... I think she would agree with this characterization. She knows a shocking amount about um, the history of medicine and surgery and anatomy. Um, is that is that how you would characterize it, Laura? <laughs> I don't shock people on a on a regular basis, but, uh, but I consider it an interest. Yeah. So how did how did you develop this interest? Is this a, is this a normal part of a medical education? Um. Well, I've always loved history personally. Uh, you know, I started life as an undergrad in the history department. Um, so I, I would have said that whatever field I went into, I was going to be interested in, in how it evolved. But I think all surgeons love history. Um, and you're always wrong when you say all of something agree with you and your passions. But, but I think it's actually really common for surgeons to, to love the history of their own field. Uh, and, and personally, and in a very biased way, I think that's partially because the history of our field is so fascinating. Um, and partially, I think it's, it's our recognition of the tenuous position we still stand in. You know, um, it's kind of a common saying in medicine and in surgery, medicine keeps you humble. Uh, every time you, you're pretty sure you know everything you need to know, something will go catastrophically wrong and teach you otherwise. And there's no better way to learn that than through the history of the field where we really have progressed in part from error to error. You know, every new thing we've been able to do has shown us that there was something about the body we didn't understand. And so we've both been able to do something wonderful and cause something horrific at the same time. And now we have a new problem to face. And so when I say that all surgeons love history, I think it's that we all respect the history of our field and, and how important it is to understand how we got here and what it cost to get us here as we sort of walk into the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I, I mean, it makes sense. Like, I mean, but it, it sounds like surgeons in particular have a kind of lived experience of being part of it, of like, yeah, we're still figuring this out. Um, I think that's really true. And that's interesting that you say it that way, because I think there are a lot of things about my field that give me this wonderful privileged view of the world. And I think that's true of all of medicine, but, but one element that I, I don't think I've specifically recognized before is, yeah, 
we're constantly seeing innovation and we're constantly put in the position of, of being asked to evaluate that innovation. I mean, I can point to two or three things right now where there's controversy in my own department about whether or not this new technology or technique is good or bad. And a lot of the ways in which we evaluate it is by pointing backwards to when we've tried something similar and maybe it didn't work out so well. And maybe we didn't realize that until we started getting five or 10 year data. Um, so we're, we're constantly seeing new things and constantly deciding on the value of those new things and the risks of those new things. And, and you have to look back to history when you're constantly being asked to, to consider your own path forward, I think. So yeah, I think That's you're really right. True. I mean, is this, um, just one more question on, I mean, is this, do you think that this is particularly distinct to um, surgery as opposed to other other areas of medicine or do you know? That's a good or? question. Um, I think it's, it's throughout medicine because certainly things change throughout medicine. We have the unique kind of position of seeing the impact of our actions much more rapidly you know, somebody who's trying to treat a chronic illness over a decade has a very different kind of cause and effect mental model than me in the operating room where the consequences of a, a slip of the hand are very immediate. <laughs> um, there's a lot of innovation happening in surgery, but it's, it's not unique to surgery. There's innovation happening yep. throughout medicine and there's new techniques and technologies throughout, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would certainly expect that progress happens everywhere in medicine and that surgery isn't unique there, but I just wonder if there's something, I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about the history of surgery. I mean, it seems like it would be at some point somebody decided to <laughs> cut into someone in order to fix them. And that is a kind of scary and bloody thing. And that, you know, yes, 3000 years later, like here we are, like, I, I mean, what is that history like? Scary and bloody. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's uh, the, the history of surgery is paved with good intentions and blood. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons we, we're all really interested in it. I mean, it's a fascinating, it's full of fascinating stories and, and scary ones and cautionary tales. And, and there are so many men and, and some women throughout history who you look back on and you say, were you a genius or a sociopath or both? <laughs> because they were doing things where a normal person would say that can't be a reasonable choice and i think us today we would say how did you justify the risks of that to yourself when you decided that you were going to try something with so little knowledge and i think by understanding our history and understanding the choices that people have made and the bold chances they took part of what we recognize is how how great a position we are in now. And as, as much as I can talk for days on everything that's wrong with our healthcare system, we also know so much more than we have throughout the history of the field. And so chances that would be unreasonable today were, were routine then because the outcome of most illnesses was death. Yep. Yep. Today, if I'm gonna justify a new experiment where I wanna try a new treatment, I have to prove that it's at least not worse than what we already have to offer. But if what you had to offer was nothing and the natural history of that disease was you died from it, you could justify trying something that might kill the patient. And we frequently yep. did. So yep. it's just, it's a totally different calculus. And the more we gain, the more that calculus changes. Um, but some of the early stories of the field are really bold. So give me, give me maybe give me one of those stories. <laughs> Let's see. Pick, pick I, mean, I mean, there's so many, you know, <laughs> one of the first ever gallbladder operations was when one of the heroes of, of early surgery uh, took out his mother's gallbladder on their kitchen table. You know, <laughs> um, the crazy. history of transplant surgery, I, I mean, all of it is insane. Um, what's a good story for you? The history of, okay, I will actually tell you a story if you'll indulge me. I will um, indulge you. I'll tell you the story of one of my personal heroes. And uh, this is, I'm not unique in this. He's, he's one of the absolute greats. So his name is Emil Theodore Coker. And he's a Swiss surgeon from like the 1880s, some late 1800s. 
Um, and Emil Coker uh, is famous for a lot of things. He is the first surgeon to win the Nobel Prize in like 1909. Um, but he also, uh, he's remarkable for a lot of things. So he's, he's known today because there's so many things that carry his name. So in operating rooms across the country, we use Coker clamps. Um, there's a Coker maneuver to reduce a dislocated shoulder. There's another Coker maneuver to dissect in the abdomen. There's a Coker hernia repair that we actually don't use anymore. There's a Coker criteria for a hip problem. There's three different Coker incisions. Like the guy was productive. Um, but uh, what he actually won the Nobel Prize for was his work on the thyroid. So for those of you that are listening that might not know, the thyroid is an endocrine gland in your neck super important because it produces thyroid hormone, which regulates your growth and your metabolism and you need it to live and to develop normally. Um, they did not know that in the late 1800s. They didn't really know what the endocrine system was and they didn't really understand hormones. So they knew that the thyroid gland existed because they've done anatomical dissections, but the most common reason that the thyroid gland would come into kind of would come up for a physician was because goiters were really common. And a goiter is an abnormal growth of the thyroid gland, most commonly caused by an iodine deficiency, which was super common in the late 1800s. So you would very frequently see people with these very kind of disfiguring growths on the front of their neck, and they can be beyond disfiguring and they can actually cause compression issues with the other structures in the neck, like, you know, your major blood vessels in your windpipe, things you need. Uh, so, at the time though, surgery to remove the thyroid gland was incredibly difficult. The thyroid gland is really vascular. It has a lot of blood vessels. And as it becomes goiterous, as it gets growth, more small blood vessels kind of join in. So you get new blood vessels. So it's a very bloody thing to remove. And in the 1800s, you know, today we have so many ways of stopping bleeding. We have cautery, electrocautery in the hospital that can actually coagulate blood vessels as we go through them. We have any number of clamps that are what we call hemostatic, hemo meaning blood, static meaning stop. Because if you picture a very small artery or vein, the, the walls are like wet tissue paper. So imagine a tube where the walls are as thin as wet tissue paper full of blood. And if you tear it, it will bleed on you and continue to bleed. And it's not that simple. Like it seems simple today because I have 20 different versions of this in my operating room every day. But if you didn't have it to create a clamp that was strong enough to totally occlude the vessel so it doesn't bleed, but gentle enough not to tear the wet tissue paper is actually kind of an amazing innovation. That was the first coker clamp, was the first okay. hemostatic clamp. So prior like a, like to- Like a sophisticated like chip clip, basically? A very sophisticated <laughs> chip clip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but allowed surgery to take place. So prior yeah. to poker, removal of the thyroid gland had an over 50% mortality, incredibly bloody. And so a number of like national societies had actually said anyone who thinks that they can operate on the thyroid gland is a butcher and should be chased out of the profession. You know, they, there's all of these really dramatic quotes about how thyroid surgery is a bloodbath and it was until Coker. So Coker comes along and in the setting of being told that if you want to operate on the thyroid gland, you're a butcher, he says, but I'm going to try it because my technical skills are just better than everyone else's. And he's right, they are. And he also develops new tools and new techniques. So he perfects the technical procedure of thyroidectomy, of removing the entire thyroid. Uh, and he does it so well that in the course of his career, he takes out like about 5,000 thyroids with a less than 1% mortality. 5,000? Context. How many is that per day? <laughs> a lot. But that's the mortality of the operation today. Yeah. Like that's how yeah. good he is. Not what he won the Nobel Prize for. So this story yeah. is only starting and it's not interesting yet. So that's this is kind of the, the history of surgery is like a history of can we and should we. Um, there's this old saying that, that used to get tossed around when I was in college that was... Um, Science can teach you to clone a dinosaur. Social science can tell you that maybe you shouldn't. And so surgery has been a push of kind of technical engineering minds figuring out how to do something and then realizing why maybe they shouldn't or maybe they need to do it in a different way. So Coker is the first person to be able to do a thyroid safely. And so then the volume goes up 
because now people can get rid of their goiters. And he gets called in like mid-career by a primary care doc who says, you know, you, you operated on one of my patients, this little girl, 11-year-old girl named Maria, and you took out her thyroid. And she was a normal, happy, healthy little girl just with a growth. And ever since you took out her thyroid, she stopped growing. She's heavy, she's short, she's got massive cognitive delays, really thick tongue, all of these strange things that I can't explain. Is there any chance it was related to your surgery? And there's no reason to think that it was because no one knew what thyroid hormone was at this point. And it would have been so easy for Coker to dismiss it and to say, nah, this has nothing to do with me. This is on you, go figure it out. It's chemical, it's poisonous, whatever. And instead he did what I think is actually his kind of greatest gift to the field. And he did the first ever single surgeon case series where he goes and he follows up on all of his patients. Because again, it was an era of can we, not should we. So it was an era where success of an operation was the patient survived and went home. Nobody was thinking beyond that. And so he started chasing down the people he'd operated on and realized that they all looked like Maria because none of them had thyroid hormone and you can't develop and grow without it. And so he spent the rest of his career trying to help understand the physiology and purpose of the gland. And it was actually for that work that he won the Nobel Prize. Um, yep. And he, he spent a lot of his career soul searching and really struggling with the consequences of what he had done before understanding the physiology of the gland. But I think it's just, it's a story that's representative of so much of the history of surgery from the technical challenges, the engineering marvels, and the incomplete understanding of physiology that is sometimes only understood when we took something out. That's amazing. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I didn't even know that we didn't understand hormones until the 1880s or later. I mean, that, so just that in and of itself, it's like, I mean, the amount that we take for granted and medical science and that people like now hormones are like, when I ask, when I like run trainings, I'm like, what's distinct about teenagers? Cause we're training teachers to work with adolescents and they're like hormones. Like they just like, they kind of like have a, they have this, I don't even know kind of, what what the what the uh, folk theory of hormones is there um but you know they know that it's something that messes with teenagers um but i mean the idea of like a slow global broadcast chemical signaling system is like quite weird and sophisticated like it's not like if you were just thinking a priori about the body you would like hypothesize something like that um, um so that i mean that's incredible and like i mean five thousand surgeries at one percent i mean just I mean, he must have been a lot better than everybody. So much better. Um, and yeah. and in, in that day, the focus was on speed. You know, you didn't really have much in the way of anesthetics. You didn't have much in the way of antisepsis. Uh, you didn't yep. have much in the way of, you know, you had no electrocautery. He was the first one to come up with hemostatic clamps. You couldn't take your time. You had to get in and get out. And the longer you're there, the more likely you are to hurt something. But in the neck, you can't go fast. It's such a small space that a small amount of bleeding uh, will, will impair your breathing. So it needed a technical delicacy that was yeah. not the key to success in most surgery in the 1800s. So, I mean, how much of what we understand about anatomy, like functional human anatomy is like coupled with the history of surgery? I mean, is this how we learn what things do? I would say physiology more than anatomy. Physiology, okay. Anatomy, you can learn, you know, in the, the history, I mean, anatomy too, the history of anatomy is, um, is a history of, of dissection. So starting with animals and moving on to cadaver dissections and in some, you know, dark places in surgical history, vivisection of prisoners um, during the dark ages was not uncommon. Um, so a lot of anatomy came initially from a dissection of animals. And then there were a lot of misconceptions that were very popular uh, amongst Greek theorists that got kind of translated on because these names, you know, like Galen, the history of anatomy, these names were so revered even into the um, kind of the um, more enlightenment period that people didn't want to question the classics. And it was... And, and so, you know, as we started doing more dissections of humans, we realized, you know, that our heart has different number of chambers than a pig's heart and these kinds of things. Um, but in, uh, the history of anatomy is, is in large part 
dissection. Um, mm -hmm. The history of physiology, there, there's a decent amount of physiology that, that is closely tied to surgical history. Um, that's certainly, interesting. I mean, yeah. that's really interesting. I mean, like, I mean, one of the themes that's kind of a, that's emerged from Jason's work, I wish you would hear because he might disagree with the way that I'm putting it, but um, but it, it's how, um, in general, progress kind of progress in science, progress in knowledge tends to be much more um, kind of coextensive and interleaving with um, progress in something practical, like you might call it engineering. Like, so if you think of surgery as the engineering of physiology or something like that, I don't know if that's, that's the right totally way to true. describe it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's like, you don't like, it's not actually the case that like Newton discovers a bunch of things and then, and then people are like, wow, like we can apply the laws of thermodynamics to steam engines. And then somebody's like, there's a thing called entropy. It goes, only goes in one direction. People are like, wow, like we need to take, like, that's not how it works. Um, it, it's much more kind of back and forth than that. And, um, I would imagine with the human body, something so complex, like something that's just not that easy to wrap your mind around that like every part interacts with every other part. And um, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think one, it's, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And, and there's so many examples of times when we understand something only because we wanted to do something for another purpose. Like you want to take out the thyroid gland because it's goiterous and then you figure out that it had a function. Um, the history of, of taking out pieces of the small intestine is really similar. Um, and we, we really understand the metabolism of different portions of the small intestine because we just tried taking them out. Um, yeah, so I think that's definitely true. Uh, I was gonna say something else on that that's, that I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, but I, I think, you know, there, it, it's, it's observation and, and counter observation. And some of those observations come from injury or from illness or from trying uh, to solve a specific problem. You know, I think there's a lot to be learned too by, by looking at the false theories of anatomy and physiology, yeah. which are always really fascinating and why someone thought that, um, because those often come from this a priori kind of, let me think about how the body should work. And that's where we get that blood regenerates in the stomach and that the heart and the arteries were for air, you know, which was a very popular um, prior to William Harvey theory on, on the regeneration of blood. Uh, you know, we didn't know that the heart pumped blood because we hadn't seen the body in motion on the inside um, or, or why the womb wanders, you know, like these, some of them very crazy historical yeah. theories on how the body works that do come from that a priori, like just thinking about it versus the kind of observational based corrections to those theories. Yep, yep, that's really, um, that's really interesting. And do you think that that's still like, that relationship between surgery, surgery and physiology is still true? It's like we still learn about the human body and its functions and all its nuances from surgery, yeah. I think so. I mean, you know, there's so much more we know. And so you're always tempted to say, what more can we learn? Um, and anytime I say that to myself, I remind myself that like in the 1920s, the director of the patent office wanted to close it because he thought everything had been invented. So <laughs> we don't know what we don't know, um, but I, I do think that we're continuing to expand our understanding of what's possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the one kind of, not even some field, but the one aspect of this that I do know more about um, a lot more about is neuroscience and obviously there there's yeah. definitely a relationship between yes. um, surgery and, and the kind of functional physiology of the brain and um, what we know about it. And, and, um, and there's, and if anything, there's been a kind of like, there's a kind of tension in the field um, of cognitive neuroscience as to like, how much can you get from kind of non, non intervent not like, you know, non manipulative, like we're just going to do an fMRI study and see what's happening as opposed to like, let's see what happens, but like this part of the brain is now gone or like lesioned or, you know, and there's TMS studies to make it artificial and that, I mean, there's very different methods to those fields. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And, and I, my mind always goes to GI, but you're right. Um, one of the places where I think, you know, hopefully we'll see the, the greatest advances because we are closer to its infancy as, as neuroscience and neurosurgery. Um, I mean, how, I mean, part, part of, um, I just wonder how widespread, like, 
how, how, what's the delta between like your perspective on all of this and let's say your patients? So like, um, like if you, like, I think, you know, if I were to kind of talk to random people, they'd be like, yeah, surgery is a thing that happens. Like, you know, they knock you out. Like there are some risks, I guess. Um, whereas you're like, it's this crazy field dominated by sociopaths. Or like, <laughs> okay, I'm we gotta correct that interpretation <laughs> first so that doesn't get us my uh, deadline. <laughs> uh, my, my, uh, my department may see this at some point. So to clarify, <laughs> surgery is very safe. Yeah. And you no longer have to be a sociopath to do it. We have great anesthesia now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there is something different though, in, in the way that you're talking about it, than I think, um, like if for you, it's a kind of much more living field where progress is coupled with risks. And, uh, you know, that is, uh, um, um, surgery for a lot of people is pretty routine, I think. And, yeah. You know, one of the interesting things about being in a service profession, um, and getting to see, but not just a service profession, you know, one of the things I love about what I do actually is... I get a really unique window into humanity um, in, in a couple different ways. I get to see a really wide swath of people. Um, you know, I've worked in hospitals in uh, Georgia, Massachusetts, California, now Michigan, you know, a lot of different places. And, and most people tend to kind of interact with people that are within their bubble. But if you work in a hospital, you, you see you see a, a really wide range yeah. of people, you know, from mm -hmm. the migrant communities in Atlanta to some very A-listers at Cedar sinai in LA. You know, there's, there's a really wide range of people that I wouldn't interact with on a day-to-day -day basis if I wasn't in the hospital. But you don't just get to see those people, you, you get to see them in extremis. Um, and, and one of the things that sometimes we talk about, or I think about quite a lot is, there is such an incredible range of reactions to what is not a normal event. And I'll say, I don't think anyone thinks of surgery as routine uh, mm. when they're on the table. You yeah. know, I tell this to my medical students actually when they come to scrub with me and every once in a while they'll come in and we're doing a day of small cases, you know, minor day surgery. And I, I'll ask them, what's the definition of a small surgery? And they'll think about it and they'll say things like, oh, well, you don't need general anesthesia or this or that or the other thing. Um, and, and the answer I always tell them is it's surgery on someone else. Mm. If it's you, there's no such thing as small surgery. That being said, there is a huge range in the perspectives and in the responses from folks who deal with such grace and equanimity with the most unexpected traumas or cancer diagnoses at a young age who roll with it and who are constantly thinking about like, well, this is my new normal you know, yep, I understand the risks and benefits, but here are my values and it, I want to try everything to people whose world is destroyed because they have appendicitis. And I try and explain to them that actually, you know, this is okay. We can fix this. Like, yes, there are risks, but I'm going to get you through this and you're going to be home tonight, you know, and, and looking at that kind of rainbow of perspectives and experiences is really, really fascinating. And I think really enlightening about how much control we have over our own response to to sort of the unexpected and the metaphysically given yeah i mean how how i mean and this gets into questions that i want to ask anyway about education i, I like how it, it, how much do you think that that's kind of perspective informed or like framework informed so like if, if you have a view of surgery and I, I won't put it as dramatically here or just a medicine or of human life where it's like look we've accomplished a lot but at the edges and even sometimes at the core, we're like pushing against entropy. Human life is a fragile thing. Like this is why we do the work that we do. And this is why there's a need for constant progress. And like, that's your background view of the kind of human condition. And then you apply that to something like medicine. Um, yeah. Like, you know, that, that, I think that that's different than like, um, you kind of take everything around you for granted and then something horrible happens, right? Um, well, I think, and I'll, I'll rephrase it a little bit. I think it is, it's all to do with your, your background viewpoints, but you know, something I'll tell people sometimes when they seem really terrified, when, you know, I can tell that this is just, they're overwhelmed for an operation that for me is routine. And again, it's not routine for them, um, but it's my day to day. And I'm trying to get them to, to understand the risks because we're so bad at conceptualizing risk and God, are we seeing that in today's world? Yeah. 
And, and, and we're in a world today where it's very hard to quantify the risks, but we're also really bad as a species at understanding and quantifying risk. And so what I, what I tell people every once in a while is like, just to put this into context, you were more likely to die on the drive to the hospital than you are from the surgery. The car you get into every day is still riskier than my operating room. It doesn't feel like that because you do it every day and you feel like you have a modicum of control over the situation. Whereas you're having to give up that control. And I think that's a big part of it too. People who really, you know, to some extent who feel like they have control over the element of risk throughout their lives versus somebody who does accept that there's some amount of unknown, but they're gonna control everything they can. Yeah. And be able I mean, to roll with it when something unexpected or uncontrollable happens. So I, I think it's it's hugely related to your to your viewpoints and your philosophy on life and to how much you've thought about that and how much you've had to think about that from other unforeseen occurrences that you've had to overcome. Yeah. And how you manage yeah. it. It, it, it. It's also, I mean, part of what's I think this is true in a lot of different areas, but what what might be maybe salient to me here just listening to you talk it's like oh the history of progress in surgery is the history of um progress in um controlling different risks like that's the, like that's part of what it is not not the whole of it like it's like understanding different things and um kind of more qualitative innovations but you know um when things seem safe um or relatively safe, at least to the surgeons, if not to the patients who are getting it, or, or to the family members um, who aren't under the knife. Um, you know, um, it's that is an achievement, right? Like that is that is kind of something that we've earned as a species, and there's you know, a long way to go. <laughs> um, and, and to take us full circle to where we started, that's why it's harder to do a clinical trial today than it was in the 1880s. In the 1880s, the risk of not doing, you know the risk of not doing anything was almost equivalent to the risk of the best available treatment. And that's not true today. Today, yeah. we have really good treatments for so many things that to suggest I have something new, you have a really high standard of proof before you can take that something new to a patient because we already have something to offer them. You know, so the, the evolution of the risks of the field as well as our risk tolerance go so interesting in I mean, if you see like yeah i mean you see both both the fact that like as a species we substantively need to be good enough at surgery so that it's like not killing everybody to kind of get to the point where you're like maybe we can approach this more systematically and you also need to kind of think of like that but it doesn't just happen automatically then you also need to like be able to do randomized control trials and patient follow-ups and like there's a whole evolution of like um, progress in terms of thinking about um, statistical controls and, and how we learn from those and safety and methodology. Um, and again, they go together. This is such a cool field. Um, I think so too. <laughs> uh, we should, we should build more and more of this into the progress studies course. I think that there's a little bit about the, uh, about progress in medicine, but definitely nothing about what you're talking about the history of surgery. Um, so um, I mean, what, so I think a lot about um, like K-12 education and even preschool through 12 education. Um, um, and one of the big questions that everybody asks, like science educators and parents is like, what does everybody need to know mm. about biology or their body or like, what, like what, what is the kind of, is there like a foundation that's going to kind of like let you navigate the things that are going to come up in life um, in a general way? Um, how do you think about that? It's a very broad question, I know, but like, how do you think about that question? And I mean, um, from both from your experience, from your patient's experience. And... Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, don't know that there's necessarily any one answer. You know, we can talk about what I think are the, the most, I, I, well, I guess there's two answers that I would think about initially. The first is what in the kind of biology, anatomy, human physiology world should people know? Um, and then the second one is, what do they need to know to be able to learn what is going to become important to them if they develop a specific problem? Yeah. Um, sort of like learning to learn, you know? Yeah. 
what do you need to teach them so that they're going to be able to understand a medical problem when it occurs, like normal versus not normal risk tolerance? And I think those are different questions. You know, in terms of the anatomy and physiology question, um, you know, so much of, of what's taught in K through 12 uh, currently uh, <laughs> is focused on like cell biology, which is just not interesting. And I think it's just, it's, it's easier and better to try and, and focus on things that are going to be observational, like you do for, for young kids in other fields. Like they get so excited when you teach them the stars and they can go outside and see a constellation. Yeah. The yeah. most perceptually obvious thing in the world is your own body. So to, to give them that empowerment to talk to them about how muscles work or how digestion works or what happens when you chew, so that literally every minute of every day they can be thinking, I'm chewing and salivary amylase is releasing. And when I swallow, I don't have to think about the muscles of the esophagus, but they're pushing my food into my stomach or it's going to get turned up. Like I talk about this sometimes with my friends, young kids, and they love it. You know, simple yeah. things like I can show them simple ways of, of, of watching the blood flow patterns to their hands. Like these things are so perceptually obvious that I think it's a great way of kind of sparking scientific curiosity in kids because it's so obviously relevant to their own experience of every minute of every day. Yeah. And then the second piece to it is we need better statistics. Um, and, and for them to understand medicine, they need to understand risk. Um, and so I think from the how are they going to be good healthcare consumers, like good safeguards of their own kind of health and make good choices from the standpoint of, you know, when is it worth the risk of not wearing your seatbelt or smoking yeah. or, um, you know, deciding to get a surgery or not get a surgery or what treatment you That's want for a disease or preventative health care you're going to do. That is a better understanding of, of the nature of risk. And I think we do not teach statistics and we need to. Yeah. And even when we do teach statistics, I don't think it's like, there are probably more people that can like you know, look up a T value in a table than there are who can kind of think about um, risk in a kind of nuanced statistical way. Um, you know, there, I mean, there's been this huge push to add statistics, to kind of teach statistics earlier, but I, I would be, I would be doubtful that that approach would um, kind of add up to um, the kind of improved personal decision making. Maybe it does at the margins, but um, that seems more like a general mindset. Um, um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the anatomy point, I think, there is, it's pretty common to do some basic anatomy, like in like early in elementary school. And then it, um, I think it fades pretty quickly from the curriculum. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think it, it is one of those areas where like, when you're like, what does everybody have to learn? Like a, a lot of times you get pushed back. It's like, there's nothing that everybody has to learn. Like, you know, like everything is individualized and really you need to learn how to learn. And you're like, what about your own body? And then people are like, oh yeah, like that seems important. Um, there's something about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, um, I know this is, a. Um, um, I mean, the, 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 just want to pause on like, that's a very different answer than like, I mean, I think most, the kind of standard way of thinking about this issue of like, what do you need to learn about medicine is, um, pretty narrowly focused on what, what true things do people not believe and how do we fix that? Like that, that is a very common frame to think about. That's biology education like evolution and vaccines like how do we get everybody like it's crazy that like you know 10 percent of americans don't believe, i don't even know what the statistics are um it's it, bigger those, than 10 percent for evolution good topics but then you you question yeah. like why why is this you know vaccine myth so prevalent and that gets back to a statistical understanding and, and being able to interpret data you know and being able to go first handed to the data um I guess I'll make a plug for reproductive health as well. That should be mandatory in the curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of like things that people don't understand that will hurt them if they don't understand them at a young age. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, um, that's a challenging one in the US um, um, for a lot of different reasons, but yeah, I agree. Um, I think kind of naturalizing that and kind of making it accessible to children. And like with so many things um, in Montessori, um, like one of the insights that we're, we're Montessori educators and one of the insights that Montessori had is like when things are hard to learn often you need to learn them earlier yeah that's um, and, and oh, it that's like really makes, it, makes it less awkward and makes and so the children are more naturally interested and it's like 
like, you, you know, one of the big problems in reading, I mean, she identified in reading, it's like, you're waiting too long to teach children to read. If you wait till there's your six or seven, you missed a window. Um, and, but the same thing is true of certain items of knowledge where there's a way that children will naturally approach things and be curious about them and you can kind of get it in early. Um, um, and I think that's definitely true for anatomy. Um, um, how, um, I'm, I'm, this is more of a curiosity question for me. In, in medical school, surgeon academy, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> but, um, I mean, do you take classes on the history of medicine? Um, I never took a formal class on the history of medicine, and I don't know that it's, uh, I don't know anywhere where it's a requirement. There are certainly places where I think it will get incorporated into the curriculum, or some elements will. Um, it depends a little bit on the interests of your professor. Um, yeah. Um, for those of you listening on audio only, there's a very fluffy cat. <laughs> Working from home today? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, it's okay. I mean, if uh, I've interviewed people with like a four-year-old screaming in the background. So this is just the life that we all live now. I mean, and so when, when, when you say that like surgeons are interested in the history of their field, is that kind of like, an, like part of the culture of surgery, like an informal thing that kind of just like you end up kind of diving into the case studies and historical references and things when you need them, and, you know? Yeah, yes. Um, I mean, you'll, you'll see sprinklings of surgical or medical history, you know, um, in the way we name societies, the Osler Society, Semmelweis Society, in the way we name buildings. Um, mm -hmm. There will often be named lectures every year that is named after a historical figure. Even when you walk the halls of a medical school and you see these, you know, gilt framed portraits of the chairs of days gone by, um, yeah. there's a, and, and part of this is just a, um, you know, a, a higher learning kind of thing. Like, in, you know, universities love their history. <laughs> Yeah. love their own history and so part of it is just medical schools are part of big universities and so we right. we honor our own history um and part of it is is kind of the things i've talked about before you know is especially as you get more niche into your field and you start and to, to your point earlier you start seeing some history form you know I'm, so I didn't talk a lot about what I do, but I'm, I'm a minimally invasive surgeon, uh, which means that I specialize in, in surgical techniques uh, where I use small incisions and a camera to do operations. Um, and those are new kind of laparoscopic, endoscopic, or robotic techniques in a lot of cases. And I don't use those all the time, but, but I have specialized training in that. Um, the first laparoscopic gallbladder operation was done in like the 90s. You know, late yeah. 80s, early 90s was a lot of the new laparoscopy. That wasn't that long ago. We have yep. practicing surgeons who remember that transition, who are, were part of that transition. You know, I've been trained by people who, you know, one of my mentors when I was a fellow, um, a guy named Dr. Phillips, Ed Phillips, helped develop modern laparoscopy. And he talks about going to a pig farm in Pennsylvania, where he was practicing in LA, and there was a guy who owned a, a surgeon who also owned a pig farm in Pennsylvania. And so they would go to the pig farm and just try stuff because it was this crazy idea that maybe if you blew up the abdomen with gas, you'd have enough space to see where you'd only need these tiny little incisions and long instruments. You work with a handle on the outside of the body and manipulate things on the inside, but you need to blow up the belly to see that. And so what kind of gas would work? And he talks about getting it wrong and the pig exploding all oh over the place. <laughs> yeah, all of these crazy things happened in his career. So it's to, to suggest that surgeons don't love history. Well, we, we feel it, we see it. You know, that yeah. the advent of laparoscopy was such a game changer. And even today, you know, robotics is, is much newer and still hasn't entirely been accepted by the field. And we're still debating on whether or not it's a good improvement or a bad one. You know, I do some robotic surgery. I think there's some places where it really gives me an advantage, but there are still people who argue about it. There are new techniques and technologies for many of the diseases I treat where we're still, you know, we're, we're, we're part of history. So I think that's part of why we're interested in it. 
That's so cool. I mean, yeah, the nineties is not, I mean, the vast majority of fields will not consider the nineties history. Um, um, I studied the history of philosophy and certainly it would be <laughs> like, like, you know, like, can we at least go back to the fifties, you know, um, before it gets counted as like very modern history. But yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, the, uh, again, neuroscience, the field that I know, it's like the first, um, you know, thing that was similar to a bold analysis study, like um, where you kind of subtracted one MRI image from another to kind of a, a blood flow image to kind of get a sense of what's going on functionally. That was the nineties. Um, like, and so the, the entire field is very young. And so the, the, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, and, and our, the field is not necessarily young. It's just right. we're continuing to change in advance. Like we're, we're arguably one of the oldest fields. I, I have um, some yeah. at my office, I have some cool reproductions of hieroglyphics showing somebody trying to treat a hernia. <laughs> but uh, but then I'll go and I'll treat it with, a, you know, a brand new Da Vinci robot, you know, and, and the person leaves with three eight millimeter incisions. So it's just, it's one of the exciting parts of the field. It's one of the exciting parts about being in an academic institution where you can contribute to that project. Even, even the, the name of that robot, I think is telling. Yeah. <laughs> the robot. Um, yeah, I mean, and then the, the um, you know, that is debated. I mean, just kind of brings us full circle back to your points about, um, this is a field where it's very salient to everybody that like progress comes with risk, you know, its own challenges that need to be, need to be solved. And so you can get something like, it's like a field where nobody debates that there is progress and that there needs to be more progress, but like people debate a lot about what counts as progress. Um, Absolutely. That is very interesting. So yeah. one more question and then I want to take questions from the audience. So um, I didn't, I didn't contextualize this properly at the beginning, but um, we will, um, there's a couple questions in chat. Um, I, I would love to take some questions live for Laura um, from those of you attending. Um, the last question is, it's big, so feel free to dodge it. It's not even a question. I can like raise my voice at the end and be like, is that not true? Um, but um, I, I mean, I'm thinking about education, which I think about all the time. I often think about um, medical education um, as this domain of human life where we have successfully set up educational institutions to train thousands of extremely specialized, competent professionals, you know, really en masse, um, that do all sorts of crazy things from the things that you've been talking about to totally different specialties um, um, around the world. Um, and, um, you know, like, I, I mean, I can't count the number of times that I've been like, if K-12 education was like, you know, medical school, like, you know, we'd be set, like, we just haven't, we haven't kind of achieved in K-12 education anything like what we've achieved in medical education. Um, is that not true? I, I, I just like, I mean, to, oh, to that's the extent it? that- That's the question? Yeah, <laughs> like, like, I, I mean, like, you know, is medical school, like, to what extent is medical school a kind of oh, significant gosh. symbol of progress in education? Oh, um, gosh. Matt. Um, so I guess uh, in the last question, I, I revealed my clinical specialty. Now I'll talk yeah. about my academic specialty. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I, I am, you know, I, I work at the University of Michigan, so I am an academic surgeon. Uh, so I also teach at our medical school and I teach our residents. But my academic interest, and for most surgeons who are, who do research, you know, they look at a specific disease process and and I don't do that as much uh, because my true academic interest is actually surgical education and medical education in general. Um, so I have a master's in education with a specialty in health professions education. And I've, I've done a surgical education fellowship. I've run a sim center, this kind of stuff. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what's wrong with our education system. Yeah. Yeah. I actually appreciate <laughs> the way you phrased it um, because there's a lot that's good about what we have and what we do. Um, and a lot, I think we can do better. Um, it's it's a little hard for me to compare medical education to K through 12. Um, obviously, I have a lot more knowledge about one of those things than the other. Yeah, and they're, then they're very different beasts. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the simplest thing I can say, or one thing I'll throw out there is the standards of success are more clearly defined in medicine. Mm -hmm. And even then we struggle. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, 
we struggle with the challenge of assessment of figuring out how to determine when you're qualified, you know, the, the kind of newest thing in, well, not the newest, but one of the big pushes in medical education right now is a change to what we call competency-based education. Um, Sounds you know, familiar. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, oh gosh, this is such a big topic. I, I, I know you wanna get to questions. I don't even know where to start with this one. You know, the, the history of medical education it started as an apprenticeship model. You know, we're, we're very much, um, still influenced by that model, but you went and you apprenticed with, you know, the doctor in town and you were finished when they told you you were finished. Um, and then medical schools came into being and they were terrible, large, you know, uh, largely because they lacked standards. Uh, you paid a certain tuition for a certain amount of time and then you left and you could put out your shingle. Um, and it was, you know, uh, the Flexner report in somewhere in the 1800s something, uh, you can go back and put in the actual year that I'm forgetting. Um, that caused a major shift in medical education in the US and Canada from a recognition that essentially we had no standards. Like we, we weren't evaluating whether or not we were producing competent graduates. We were just hanging on to them for four years. Um, and so a lot of things have shifted since that time. Uh, but we, we still face the challenges of, of how to judge competency um, and how, you know, what does a physician need to know? And in, in today's age of increasing subspecialization, what should be included in an everyone needs to know at medical school? What should you learn in residency? What do you need to know when you graduate residency? How much supervision do you need as a new attending? So it's there, oh, this is too big a topic, Matt, I think. But, What's uh, interesting to me, though, is that these aren't actually fundamentally different than the questions you ask in K-12 education. Um, like, yeah. how do you, like, how, like what, what exactly are you assessing for competency? How do you assess it? What do you need to know in general? What do you need to kind of be set up to know in the future? Um, like, it, it's, um, exactly. you know, how do you, how do you keep track of different paths that you know that people are on? How do you keep track of the fact that, um, how do you account for the fact that, um, people don't even know what their path is necessarily and that there's going to be shifts and you're, you're, you're trying to future proof people. Right. Um, um, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I think the, I think the challenges are, are really similar and, and yeah. your, your idea of future proofing is one I think about all the time, you know, especially because we're in a field that changes so much. You, yep. You, yep. How do you evaluate that they're competent on what they can do today and they'll continue to be competent on what needs to be done tomorrow? How do you teach them to learn? Yep. Yep. So I do have two more questions for you, but I'm going to get to some, some of the audience questions if there are any. I see a couple. Um, so um, Regina, who I know is a Montessori teacher um, in the Boston area, I think, um, still, um, she asks, um, advances in imaging also probably drive new innovations in surgery? Like, um, is there a relationship between kind of medical technology and um, surgical advances? I think that's definitely true. Um, in, in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that comes up most obviously is as imaging gets better, you can know things without cutting into the body. Um, so just a classic example of that is appendicitis. Uh, you know, there are certain clinical signs of appendicitis where if you have the right type of pain in the right place and you have certain lab abnormalities, it's probably your appendix, but not 100%. And so before CT scans were common, uh, it was just accepted that there was a 20% false negative rate for taking some to the operating room. So of every 10 people you took to the OR for appendicitis, only eight of them That's had crazy, disease. 20%. And we just accepted it because that was the best that we had and it was a pretty safe operation and most of them didn't have complications and untreated appendicitis can kill you when the appendix right. bursts and you get sepsis. Um, now we have CAT scans. And so the uh, false negative rate, you know, with a positive CAT scan, it's something like 98.9 or, you know, percent positive predictive value and a 99% negative predictive value. Like if your CAT scan shows you have appendicitis, you have it. Mm -hmm. So we know before we operate. So to some extent, imaging has dramatically changed the decision to operate. It makes us able to plan operations more effectively. And then there's a whole nother field called interventional radiology, which is putting some of us out of business in a very good way, <laughs> where we're, allowed, we're able to do things minimally invasive, image guided with real time ultrasound or CTs, where we're able to do things with a needle rather than a scalpel. So in lots of ways, 
advances in imaging and advances of surgery have gone hand in hand. That's really cool. Um, so I will ask you the two questions that I wanted to ask you. So you, I told you that these were coming. Um, this is, we ask this at the end of all of these speaker, we ask all of our speakers at the end of these, um, what advice do you think um, that teams get or that you got as a team? Um, common advice that you think is, is there such advice that you think is wrong? Yeah, so you did tell me you were gonna ask me this and I told you, I said, I immediately have something that I'm thinking of and I don't know that you'll like it. <laughs> so we'll but you might, I'll explain. Um, so the piece of advice that I got as a teen and that I hear people give a lot that I hate, which is gonna sound terrible, is do what you love. Do what you love, follow your passion, sometimes even follow your dreams when it's meant in a specific way, but do what you love is, is the incarnation of it that always strikes me. And it sound, it, it, it's hard to argue, right? Like it's hard to say, no, don't do what you love. And I, I think it's meant to say, don't think that you have to do what your parents tell you or what society tells you is the right thing to do. You can follow your own path and that's great. But the do what you love formulation for me always felt like you were supposed to already know what you want. No. And the emphasis to me always seemed like the love comes first and then the love motivates the work. And I think there's a really bad fallacy there. It, it was almost like a, a, like a soulmate version of a career. It's like love at yep, first exactly. sight. And, and you look at someone and you say, I love you. And, and you love the idea of that person. And that's not a reason not to go talk to them because you wanna find out if the idea you have is correct, if you even like the idea in actuality or if the person fits that idea, but you don't love them yet. And similarly, you know, to tell a 15 or a 16 year old or hell a 35 year old who's trying to figure things out, do what you love. If I say that to you and something immediately comes to mind and you're like, well, what I love is playing the cello, play the cello and that's amazing and be happy. But I think for a much more common experience is, well, I'm not sure what I love. And I think the advice I would give instead of do what you love is do things as though you love them. Throw your body, mind, and soul into things to figure out if you love them. Because you know some things about yourself. So you know that there's something you're going to have a little bit of love at first sight with. Or you're going to have fascination at first sight. Yeah. And pour yourself into it. Because I think what I think is true is that the love doesn't come first. The work comes first. And I think yeah. through work, we find the love. I wish really badly that I was like, I totally disagree with that so we could have an argument about it. But um, in fact, I don't. Um, I, I really agree with it. I might quibble with like a formulation or two. Um, I, I think, um, I don't think it's quite that you do things as though you love them. It's that you're, you're kind of drawing on existing motivational resources that you have in order to kind of like be action oriented and pursue things and see if you can kind of make those things grow. Um, so you're not faking it, um, but... Um, no. But um, you yeah, I think totally... the emotion, but that your ability to go all in on something is a choice yeah. you make. Yeah. And it's think... not dependent on, you don't have to wait for your one true love to go all in trying things. Yeah. I mean, I, I think of this as like a kind of micro individual level instance of progress that people take for granted. Um, so when people have something that they love, that they do, it's because some work has been done to kind of like create that capacity within themselves to kind of feel that kind of passion, um, to, um, to know how to act with respect to it, to know how to make choices, to know, to know how to kind of push through when the work is hard, to kind of like under, understand and appreciate the nuances of value that like yeah. kind of give you a deep ball of motivation. And for some people, that's difficult conscious work that they do throughout their entire lives to kind of maintain that motivation. And it's important work, I think, um, to kind of keep yourself happy in your work. And for other people, it's not, and it can seem magical, but really what's going on in those cases is somehow they did that work before they were kind of fully conscious of it. Um, when yeah. they were and, and, you know, that does happen with, with some people. Um, um, and um, it's, it's, um, it didn't happen to me. And, and, um, and, and it's an, I, I agree, it's infuriating to me when that's kind of taken as the model. It's like, look within yourself and find what you magically already want right. to do. And it's just like, I don't, like, I didn't want to be a poet when I was seven, right? Um, yeah. 
Um, so I think that's great advice. And um, thank you so much, Laura. This has been totally fascinating. Um, how should people keep track of you? Are you on Twitter? Uh, Are you a Twitter person? <laughs> I am on Twitter. I, I will I will be honest, I often forget I'm on Twitter. And so I will uh -huh. go radio silent for long periods of time, but I'm I'm gonna be better about getting out there and posting uh, at least my work so you can follow the the sometimes interesting. Yeah. Well, I think they're interesting, but sometimes niche things that I'm doing. Um, uh, I'm happy if you wanna send any of your students my email address, uh, more than happy to talk to you at length about why surgery is amazing and uh, oh. how you can get exposure to medicine. But um, but yeah, I am on Twitter uh, I, at Dr. Laura Mazur, if anybody wants to follow my infrequent updates there. <laughs> you should definitely follow Laura on Twitter. You can follow us at, at Progress Course on Twitter. You can follow me at, at M. Bateman. And um, yeah, I guess if you want to, uh, if you want to reach out to Laura via email, contact us at Progress Studies and um, we'll, we'll put you in touch. Thank you again so much, Laura. This has been awesome. Um, and we will see you all for the next episode of the Torch of Progress, which I think is in two weeks. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>